Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. my friends. It's great to be back at Berkeley again. Uh, thanks to all the organizers or the supporters for Veritas Forum for making this happen. And uh, thank you especially for taking time out to, to come here. You know, I was on sabbatical at Berkeley here several years ago, 2009 to 2010, and uh, I think probably my, it's my family's favorite place to be in the world. And the food is fantastic. <laughs> You know, the great thing about college life, you guys as college students now, the great thing I encourage you guys to think about and struggle with is that you can now, more than any other time in your life, you have the freedom to ask about big questions. You have this great time to sit around, have pizza, talk till two in the morning. It's never gonna happen again, right? Now is the time you can ask about big questions. You can talk about the meaning of life. How do you measure what reality is? Is there a God? How do you know? And why are infinity scarves so popular? <laughs> it's just a scarf. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> so today, today we're here to talk about big ideas, right? God, science, reality. I mean, those are big words. But each one of us has our own perspective on what reality is. How do I know what you think is real is really real? I mean, who are we to say what's real at the end of the day? No, there are even different kinds of realities, right? There's, there's like math realities. Let me show you one, right? This is the gauss bonnet theorem. So what it says is, <laughs> what it says is that if you add up the curvature, the integrate, is add up, if you add up the curvature at every point on a surface, it's gonna equal two pi times the Euler characteristic. What that means is it's gonna be fixed. It means if I wiggle the surface and stretch the surface, move it around, the curvatures at all those little points are changing. But if you add it up, it's all going to stay constant. It's one of the most amazing results I know of. Some of you are getting turned on by this. It's great. <laughs> but others of you agree with Stephen Colbert when he says, equations are the devil's sins. <laughs> You know, so there's this notion of mathematical reality, right? But there's also physical reality. For example, Stephen Hawking writes in his most recent book, he says, the universe does not have a single existence or history, but rather every possible version of the universe exists simultaneously. It's a theory of the multiverse. So this right here is just a snapshot of all of the realities that are out there. I mean, is that what's really there? Is, is that the notion of reality we want to get behind? You know, for thousands of years, this notion of truth and reality have always been linked to a notion of God. And uh, today in the 21st century America, reality is no longer measured by God or church or holy days. The belief in religion, it's no longer relevant. It's sort of like a scaffolding. You, you just need it to keep it in check till science comes and cleans it up for us. And this is best expressed by the work of Michio Kaku. And he says this, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from divinity. So in time, whatever you need your notion of God to be, it'll be taken care of and explained. It's just a crutch. Science has become the all-encompassing measure of what is real. Black is the new white, science is the new God. How do we get this way? You know, I just want to step back and just talk to you just a little bit about this. You know, there's a time of the Renaissance, and during the time of the Renaissance, art and music and math and literature all fit together. They work together in beautiful ways. And because of this, we had faith and reason and beauty were interconnected. You had resulting in paintings, poems, cathedrals, inventions, designs. And after this, the Enlightenment era came around 1750. And here, reason was advocated as the primary source of authority. Ideas must be tested, measured, and evaluated. Look, you just can't go around and tell me the sun is in the center of our solar system just because you believe it. Test it, evaluate it, measure it, prove it to me. This is what the Enlightenment era asked for. Now, I'm a huge fan of this era. I love the Enlightenment era. It's one of the major force that we have for progress, for understanding how the world works. Better cars, better transportation, better medicine, better ice cream. I love all these things. It's great. 
And the problem is, I think that this idea of enlightenment has been taken to an extreme. So today we try to explain everything through science. Let me give you a quote by Bertrand Russell, a great mathematician and mm -hmm. philosopher. He writes this, whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods. And what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. You see, we're putting all our chips in the scientific bucket. Now, one major consequence of this thing, because of the Enlightenment, is something called dualism. Let me show you what this is. In the Renaissance, you have this art and math together, faith, reason together, religion, politics together, unmeasurable things, measurable things together. Now, let me just explain to you what religion and politics are. Religion, to me, is the answer you would have to big questions. And politics are how that translates into day-to-day -day things. Of course, the way you think about big ideas is going to impact the way you think about day-to-day -day things. So there's a relationship between them. They're not the same, but there's certainly an overlap between it. Now, here's what the Enlightenment era did. It didn't say it's one or the other. It actually said it's one versus the other, right? On this side is the art major who is kind and sensitive and caring, who loves people. <laughs> On this side is the math major, the cold-hearted punk, <laughs> but somehow sexy in his own way, you know? <laughs> sterilize this world. You see, I don't want to cut it up so there are these clean things I get, the measurable things, and the dirty things that I don't want to handle. I don't want to do that. You see, I want to deal with all of it. I want to deal with the entire world that I have. I love messy things. Let me give you a couple of examples of messy things I love. Here's one, ice cream. There's an amazing ice cream place in Berkeley I know about, but let me tell you about this thing, right? It's called Grader's Ice Cream. They make it in Cincinnati and Columbus, Ohio. This is called Black Raspberry Chip. It is heaven on earth. The chocolate chips are so big, and they're made of so much fat that when you bite it, it melts in your mouth. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Let me tell you something else that's messy that I love. My family. It's great. <laughs> Seems great right now, but let me let me tell you uh, tell you a little bit more detail. First of all, you'll notice that uh, my wife there doesn't look like me. <laughs> so, she will be the one to tell you that, you know, marriage is hard as it is, but if you marry somebody outside your race, it makes it even harder, right? You have this tension going on, different cultures coming together. And then you have that two on the right, this one on the left, right? Their lives are messed up. With us as parents, what's their identity going to be about? And then you have that middle one, that little one. Here's what she is. Her life is gone. Blonde haired, blue eyed, dream girl of mine, right? What is her? I mean, can you imagine how much of a struggle it's going to be for her to grow up in my family? But at the same time, I wouldn't trade any of it. I love this messiness that we have. Uh, let me get to this in one second. Whatever meaning we have, whatever notion of truth, reality there is, I need to address it in the everyday mess of stuff. It needs to be more than just a theory in my life. Now, I love science. I'm a scientist, I'm a mathematician. Look, it's a wonderful tool to measure things, to find patterns in things, to make predictions of this world. But I don't think it's fully equipped to handle the full mess and complexity of life. See, science is just one language of truth. It's just one tool in a toolbox. We need other tools, my friends, to make sense of this world. We need writers, philosophers, theologians, musicians, artists to capture and express the full immensity of life. Friends, science does not have a monopoly on reason. It does not have a monopoly on logic. And it certainly doesn't have a monopoly on truth and reality. Let me show you how different languages and disciplines come together in my own world of math. See, when most people think of math, you think of trig, algebra, calc. Some of you are getting nauseous right now. <laughs> understand. But you know, few think of math in terms of pictures, and I'll tell you why. Let me give you this quote by John Littlewood, a great number theorist at the turn of the 20th century. He says, a heavy warning used to be given that pictures are not rigorous. This has never had its bluff called and has permanently frightened its victims. Here's what he says, even in the own math world, we don't take pictures seriously. We push art and visual design to one side. See, even in my own math world, this enlightenment world is ripping things apart. Let me give you a concrete example. Look at these four pictures, right? The four different pictures of four-dimensional polytopes. You know, just like a cube is a three-dimensional thing you can draw a picture of, these are four pictures of four-dimensional things. 
Now, it turns out all four of these pictures are the same. They're made of the same pieces put together, except you're looking at it from a different perspective. So here's my question. What is the proof that all of these are the same? How can you guarantee, convince me that all four of these pictures are the same? And here's the answer. The proof is right here. That is the proof. You see, you don't need an equation. You don't need a theory. The proof is this picture. Now, the reason many of you don't get that proof is because you suck. <laughs> this way visually when you have a math problem, but that's the part of the enlightenment I'm talking about. It's already starting to cut the way we think. So look, I want to show you how math and art today are not on the opposite ends of the scale anymore, but they're actually closer than ever before. The enlightenment walls are crumbling. Let me give you an example. Oregon. I think this is one of the most beautiful examples you can think of. This particular is a pop-up book by Robert Sabuda and Matt Reinhardt. I think pop-up books are actually pieces of art in your hands. Absolutely gorgeous things. And this origami notion, you think, oh, that's just for kids, man. This is some art you know, you know, projects you do in like second grade. And not at all. Let me tell you how the boundaries of origami are crossing between math and art. Let's take a look. James Webb Telescope. This is a telescope that is the size of a tennis court and it's gonna crush Hubble when we send it in space. It's supposed to be launched in 2016. Now here's the catch. How do you take something that big and launch it in space? You have to fold it up and put it inside a rocket. So now origami does not come into play. How do you fold it the right way? You fold it too much, all those crease lines are gonna give you problems to actually get the right images. You fold it too little, it doesn't fit in the rocket. These notions of origami are at the boundary of cutting edge ideas that we have. Here's something else. Stent design. This is the Kurbayashi stent. A student walked, um, was in Japan visiting a friend of hers, and she walked into an origami museum. She was inspired to come up with a stent as a med student. Here's what it does. A stent is something you put inside your artery to open it up, to let the blood flow better. So this thing actually opens up into this thing, right? Just based on simple origami folds. And this was her contribution. So origami isn't just for kids anymore. It's actually at the cutting edge. It's worth $2 billion right now in this industry. Here's something else that shows up in origami design, just leaf folding. Have you ever noticed, especially this week, amazingly, that when you go outside, like, everything is green? Yeah. <laughs> this happens in Massachusetts, where I'm from, right? It's bleak winter, all the trees are gone, and then within like a week and a half, everything is green. And that's because the plants don't immediately grow leaves. They've been growing leaves the whole time, but they've been folded up and curled for the right time to come so they can absorb the photosynthesis without having those leaves die. They're actually doing origami folding, and different leaves are folding in different patterns. And we still don't know why that's happening. That's something I'm trying to figure out with some biologists. Here's something else that happens. Protein folding. The way your body folds protein is this little origami design. There's a little cylinder, and out of it comes little sticks. As these sticks come, they form into kinks, which forms a three-dimensional key that interacts with your body. Now that key gets a kink in a wrong way, you get mad cow disease or you get Alzheimer's. We have no idea about the complexity of how proteins fold. We're still trying to figure this out. Again, same notions. Let me show you finally how this all wraps up with art. There's a friend of mine named Eric Demain. This is a work of his and his father's, Martin Demain. This is in the MoMA, Museum of Modern Art in New York. And uh, Eric was 19 when he got his PhD in computer science in Waterloo. And MIT came to him and said, you have a job here. So uh, Eric said, you know, I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure if I can take it. And they said, what do you need? This is MIT, you know, kind of the stuff you do is probably one of the best places in the entire world for you to have a new track position. And he said, yeah, you know, my dad needs a job. So what does your dad do? Well, he, he, he's a glass blower. So MIT built his dad a glass blowing studio two floors below his office. <laughs> and today they've written over 300 papers together. Eric just won the MacArthur Genius Grant when he's about 25 years old. So MIT was not foolish to do this. With his dad's ability of art, with Eric's ability of bringing these things together, these guys are the new renaissance of what's going on. And without math, this thing, which is a flat piece of paper, you can never fold it like this. These ideas don't exist. And without art, you can't even think of those problems. The new way of blending those things together, the one we've been cutting up all this time, is now coming back together. My friends, all of you at Berkeley, you know, Berkeley is amazing for so many different departments. They're just super in different fields. I encourage all of you not to partition your world into just thinking that the 
computer science world and the science world and the physics world is somehow more important than any of the other departments out there. Be really careful how you value and find truth outside of the scientific realm. <coughs> so what do I want? I want a model, I want a theory, I want a story that can handle the full, beautiful mess of this world. Now, I'm ambitious. I want a theory of everything, right? I, I want a theory to handle all the big things in this world. Things not scientific, like, like beauty, relationships, justice, you know, all those big words that we can't quantify. I want to make sense of it all. Now, this is why Victoria's Secret doesn't sell clothes using spreadsheets and charts, right? They use beautiful, naked women. <laughs> we love physical beauty. That's what we're about. This is why we go to concerts and ball games, because we want a shared experience with our friends. This is why we listen to people like Oprah or Deepak Chopra or music and mysticism, because we thirst for something bigger than us. We want encouragement about some big things that's going on. This is why our hearts burn when we watch 12 Years a Slave or The Godfather or The Matrix. Do you guys remember that scene in The Matrix? Neo walks through the metal detector. And it goes up and he says, excuse me, sir, would you mind emptying your pockets of loose change? And <laughs> every time I see that, I just start crying. <laughs> because we hunger for justice, for retaliation, for payback. We want things to be set right again. Come on, Neo, set it right, brother. That's what we want. Now, which model, which story, which theory best explains all of these hungers? The Enlightenment viewpoint says the following thing. It says, everything can be understood through science. We're dealing with issues, my friends, far larger in complexity than black holes or genetics or gauss bonnet It's too big for science to handle. And believing that science is the only language of truth, to me, is an incredible leap of faith. I think it's as large a leap of faith as a belief in a god. So, to me, personally, no story, no theory is as satisfying in explaining the world, all of the world, as the Christian faith. So let me be clear. I don't believe in the Christian theory because it gives my life meaning. I don't believe in it because it's emotionally satisfying. I'm a mathematician. I have no emotions to satisfy. <laughs> You know, it's the same reason that I believe in physics. I believe in physics, you know, the existence of atomic forces, quarks, bosons, things that I have no idea about, things that I can't see. I believe in all those things because that's the theory that it best explains the physical world. And it's not because physics makes me happy. That's not why I believe in it. And the reason I believe in the Christian story, what is the story that the world is broken due to our separation from God, that this God has pursued us to bring us back to him and it's seen ultimately in the historical life, death, and resurrection of this man called Jesus. I believe in this story because it's the best one that explains all the deep questions and the mess and the hungers that I see within myself. Now, let me close with just sharing why I find the Christian faith to be so compelling. To me, this story is not theoretical. It is not philosophical. It is not metaphysical. To me, this Christian faith is grounded in history. And it's making incredible historical claims. And it culminates in the resurrection of this man called Jesus. And this resurrection is the linchpin of the entire faith. Now, you can't use tools of science to talk about resurrection, just like you can't use the tools of science to talk about whether Abraham was resurrected or Benjamin Franklin was shot or any of these ideas. You have to use different weapons, different tools. Namely, tools of history. But you can bear on it the weapons of history and test and see if the claims hold. And I'm convinced that they do. Now, unlike any faith I know, the Christian story boldly claims that this mess that I see around me is actually built into the very heart of God. This mess is central to the story. And that's why he's called Emmanuel, God with us in this mess, in this pain. And the death of Jesus shows that God does not accept the brokenness of this world. That pain and injustice is given a solution here. And in this death, we see God amazingly sharing responsibility with us for our mess. And the resurrection of Jesus, you know, it's not a spiritual ghost. It's a flesh and blood resurrection. It says that to God, this flesh and blood world matters. 
Ice cream matters, sex matters, earth matters, flesh matters. This beautiful world will be set right because it matters. It won't be thrown aside. And finally, as with any theory, I want to test it myself. I tested it. And I see it in the life of others who test it. And I, when I practice this theory, it frees me from brokenness. It offers true acceptance to me. And in me, I see more forgiveness. I see more peace, more understanding of how this world works, a wisdom to live, live life well. And this is because the goal of the Christian is to imitate a God who does not require blind allegiance, but who died for his enemies and prayed for their forgiveness. So let me leave you with a quote with one of my favorite books. Um, Princess Bride. <laughs> it says the following thing, life is pain. Anyone that says different is selling something. Here's what I mean by that. I'm not here to say that in this little talk that you've heard, that's going to answer all your amazing questions, and now life is going to be perfect. I want you to wrestle with it. Look, my friend, these are deep, hard questions, because we're talking about deep, hard things, way harder than scientific things. You know, wrestle with it. Talk to each other. Don't be afraid to get messy. Thanks for your time. So the question was, um, this person was saying they grew up in their faith. How can I act and believe in a Christian faith when the people that they have gone to church with don't act like Christians at all? That's a great, it's a great question, and there's no, there's no magic answer to it. I'll tell you a little story of mine to try to explain it. I grew up in India, in the south side of India, south side. And uh, <laughs> I came to the States, and I, you know, I started going to church with my family. And I went to high school in the States, and most of the people I talked to in my high school, we would talk about faith randomly once in a while. They'd say, yeah, we're Christian. But it was just a word they would say. It was something they would do as a, as a cultural marker. And I found out that they really didn't hold the tenets of the Christian faith at all. So I just assumed that anybody who's Caucasian wasn't a Christian. Wow. Just like, all right, that's my guess. And then I actually met some people who were Christians in college. It's the first time I actually did it. So, to answer that question, I think it's really easy to put a badge called Christian on anything. Right? It's easy to put a badge of anything today, especially in the Western culture. But most cultures, if you carry the word Christian around you, most, uh, in most of the time periods we've had, especially in the Roman times, or if you even talk about it in the East today, it's a hard thing to carry around and say that you are one. I think it's easy to have that badge. So. It's easy to say anything you want to do. It's hard to live that life out. And if you look at scripture, just for a second, one of the, the group of people that Jesus was the hardest on was never the people who weren't believers, but there were always people who were believers. There were always the Jewish nation who said, look, man, you represent my name on earth. How can you carry my name like this by doing this way? So that struggle has always been there. All right, next question. What about Christianity doesn't make sense to you? There has to be something that still doesn't sit well with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, instead of saying one particular thing, I will tell you this general thing. I think I struggle with the Christian faith a lot of times, especially as it comes to the cultures today. You know, there's a tension between what God would want you to do versus what you think is right and what everybody around you thinks is right. right? And uh, that tension is absolutely real. Now, there's two ways to resolve that tension. One is to say, well, I'm reading the Bible wrong. It must completely mean something else. When you are all, you know, when the Christian faith is saying X, it really must mean Y, because that's what makes me happy. Or you could just say, well, the Christian faith is completely wrong, because it doesn't fit at all. And let me tell you why, because there's a tension, because I don't fully, I can't fully take the entire Christian faith and drink it easily. I'm not saying I don't believe it, but I just don't drink it easily. That actually makes me happy. And I'll tell you why that makes me happy, that there's this tension. It makes me happy because 
if there is this absolute truth with a capital T, and if somehow I agree with it 100%, that's a little creepy, don't you think? <laughs> that this Indian kid who grew up on the south side, who's now living in America, who's living in 21st century America, all of a sudden agrees with the capital truth that holds true across culture and time. And the fact that that makes my stomach turn a little bit, the fact that I don't fully get it, makes me believe that I probably don't have the capital T in me. So the fact that there is this struggle is a marker to me that I'm probably struggling with the right things. I'm willing to entertain the idea that there is a God, but how do I know he's the Christian God? That's a good question. So the question was, I'm willing to believe that there's a God. How do I know the God is a Christian God? Yeah. So I look at things from a math perspective, right, as a scientist. And so for me, here's the way I would, uh, I would think about it. Everybody has a notion of what they think truth is. Every religion has a claim to it. And the Christian religion is throwing its hat in the ring. If you're an atheist, there's a claim too. You're throwing that hat in the ring. You say, I totally don't believe in a God. There is no God. Throw that hat in the ring. You want to test as a scientist to see which of these theories make sense. The reason for me that Christian faith holds water, is stronger, is because there's actually claims in the faith that I can test. And more than any other religion that I know of, is that the Christian faith bases its truth on historical data. It actually says historical things. Now, whether those historical things happen or not is a separate thing. But it says, you know what? It's not God giving me absolute truths in a book. But it's actually God who's interacted with his people through time. That there was this nation. They were invaded. Another nation came. These things happened. Kings rose up. And God is invading and speaking through that time. Eventually it came, culminating in the life and death. And I claim the resurrection of this one person. And that's a historical act. If the Christian faith was only a book of truths or a book of laws independent of history, then I'd have a hard time buying it to say that that's better than anything else. But the fact that the historical faith of the Christian notions of faith are linked together, that this historicity and the Christian faith fit together, lets me actually say, I can actually test this and see if it's true. It makes more sense to me. Just a reminder that in addition to texting and tweeting, feel free to come down front. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're intimidated, eventually I'll call on you. So but for now, we have plenty of texting questions. You seem to take the resurrection account literally. Do you take the creation account in Genesis literally? If so, how do you reconcile that with science? That's a great question. So the question was, you seem to take the resurrection account literally in Scripture. Do you also take the creation account literally? And if so, how do you reconcile all of those things with science and with scripture? I think one of the biggest um, tensions that we've had between, no, I actually find it kind of silly that there is a tension even between the Christian faith and science. I just find those things to be actually, I don't even know why it's there, but it, I thought of it for a little bit and I think I realized why. It's because in some sense, both sides, either certain Christians or certain scientists, take the Bible, and both of them are reading it through the eyes of the Enlightenment. Both of them are reading it in a very literal sense. They both are reading it as if it was a document written by reporters. So on one side, you'd say, you know what? It says seven days, baby. Seven days. That's a reporter's documentation. I go for that. On the other side, it's going, seven days? You're kidding me. It says seven days. It's complete junk. But the problem is, Scripture was never meant to be read as a reporter writing things. Now, certain parts of Scripture is complicated, right? For example, the first 11 chapters of Genesis has a feel to it. Chapter 12 has a completely different mark on the way the life of Abraham starts. Then you have the Psalms, and then you have the Proverbs, then you have the life of the kings. And then you come to the Gospels, these four stories about Jesus. A lot of those actually have a reporter's feel to it. You know, if you actually look at the very end of those Gospels, they're kind of like, there's actually dot, dot, dots in some of them. Like, they, things have happened, and they just don't get it. It's like, what the heck? The guy walked through a wall had food with us. What? Right? And they're not <laughs> They haven't figured it out yet because it's so fresh. And then Paul's letters, they're actually letters about struggles to churches. The fact that you cannot take scripture and read it, read it literally, verbatim, as you would a scientific text, 
It asks you, this is a messy piece of document because it talks about God's interaction with idiots like us. And thus, it's going to be messy when you read it. You have to be careful how you read it. So going back to that question that you asked about, I think when you actually get to the Gospels, they are talking about truths that happened. They are talking about events that happened fresh at that time period. But if you talk about Genesis, the first several chapters of Genesis, it's not a fresh reporter's account. In fact, let me give you one example about that in Genesis. The first chapter of Genesis tells you the following thing. God created you know, the heavens, then he created the planet, then he created the trees, and eventually, the la one of the last things he did was he created man. And then he took a day of rest, right? The seventh day. That's Genesis 1. Genesis 2 says, one of the first things God did was he created man. And then he created all these other things for him. And you're thinking, you're kidding me, right? You read this as a scientist, you're going, contradiction right there. <laughs> Throw it away. <laughs> and that's what you should do if you read it as a literal document. But let me just give you a glimpse as to how to read Genesis, and we'll move on to the next question. Here's the glimpse. The glimpse is Genesis 1 at that time period was written. That entire time period was a Babylonian epic of creation was. And here's how creation was. It was where one god ripped his mother god into two pieces and the heaven and the earth were formed. And this god, Marduk, created men out of clay as slaves to take care of the earth. And the Genesis 1, I think, is an account of sort of what really did happen, sort of how the creation really did occur, right? First big things and eventually the creation of man. And Genesis 2 was written as a note of clarity to say that if you somehow think that if you read Genesis 1 that man was an afterthought, that God did that as the very last step before he closed the book, Genesis 2 was written to say, in fact, God did this entire thing for the sake of man. The whole world was created for his benefit, to honor him, to not say that he is just a piece of clay, that he is a lot more than that. So the way you read Genesis 1 and 2 is so different than when you read the Gospels. It is messy. This is not an obvious way to read scripture, but I encourage you to push ahead. Okay. <laughs> Moving on to the movie part of the segment. <laughs> Questions out of the audience. Have you guys ever seen The Incredibles? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite movies. Just love it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I share that with you. <laughs> <laughs> How can one believe in a God? Woo! There is a God. How can one believe in a God if, uh, if it's not easy to see and experience Him? If He really wants us to know Him, uh, why isn't it easy? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, you know, it's interesting how we have different measures and value systems on certain things. Like, to me, if you ask a physicist, do you know all of science? In fact, if somebody asks you, here's all of science, here's all of physics in the entire possible you could know. What percentage of physics do you know? They would say, I probably know 2%. We as human mankind, we only know probably about 2% of physics. It's so rich out there. If you ask a mathematician, how much math do we as humanity know? I would honestly tell you we know about 2 to 3%. A little bit more. One percentage more than the physicists, by the way. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there's so much math out there that we don't know. Now, at the same time, that physicist and you and me, we're willing to walk into a plane that carries us, although the plane is designed and constructed by theories of aerodynamics. We only know 2%, and yet we're willing to put our risk on something. We can come into this building designed by engineers to hold it up and the roof won't fall on our heads. We only know 2% of all the physics that are out there. I think that's the same way about faith in general. Is that to say that, you know what, I need to know 90% about God before I could take a leap of faith. It's a dangerous thing to say because we're talking about the God of creation. What the heck do I know about him? Let me just give you another example. Do we know that Abraham Lincoln was shot? And was that how he died? No, almost everybody in the room would say, yeah, absolutely, you know, he, was di he died in the theater. Well, what scientific evidence do we have? 
Like, can we repeat the experiment and see whether he died? <laughs> well, no. I mean, we put it on historical truths, right? There are these historical ways of measuring whether that thing happened. So we take historical risks based on that thing, and we have historical tools to study it. For me, the reason I put faith in this particular, you know, this particular theory, this particular story called the Christian faith, is because I think it has enough historical faith for, for me to be convinced that way. I see it in the work in the lives of others. I see it when I actually start practicing it, it, it works. So I would love to have God here hanging out, holding his hand. Getting to know him and say, hey, this is my friend, Big G, right? I would love to say that. <laughs> but, uh, but just because I only have 2% doesn't mean that it's not enough to have faith in it. I do that in so many other things in my life. Why not there? Sorry, Professor, you're not giving me any softball questions. That's all right, man. What is the most difficult part of your life right now? <laughs> is your faith helping? Or is it making Oh my goodness. <laughs> so the question is, what is the most difficult part of my life right now? Oh my <laughs> is it helping and, or is it making it acute? Is it making it more acute? Wow. So, I will tell you, gosh, this is a, the only reason it's tricky is I don't know if I have the permission to talk about this. Uh, and, yeah, I'll talk about it. <laughs> I think the most difficult part of my life, which is probably true almost any time in my life, is my marriage. Right? That's why I was kind of struggling with, I don't mind talking about my marriage at all, but my wife, who usually likes to have contracts signed before I mention her name in public. Um, so, but I'll just tell it, tell it to you in a very superficial way, right? And sort of in a in broad brush stroke, sort of in fine detail. But here's what, to me, marriage does. It actually puts two people uh, in tension with one another, right? Because you're living together, you're accountable for one another, you need to love each other, and they know, each person knows everything about the other person, right? You're just laid bare as to who you are. You can't hide, right? People might look at me and say, wow, like, that shirt looks nice on him. My wife might not say that, right? She's like, dude, I know what you look like, right? That's not, so she can, she knows me completely fully in every sense of the word. Now, the reason I think it's, um, it's a struggle is my job is not to work towards a 50-50 marriage. That's not my job. My job is not to say, look, I've done half, you do the other half. It's a 100-0 marriage. That's what I think marriage is. I'm supposed to give everything I have to take care of my girl. That's it. And the reason it's awful is because I don't do that. Right? In other words, I, I realize how pathetic I am. I walk into Gap, Banana Republic, I don't know, pick a story like Jake, right? I walk in there. And uh, my wife walks in there and she goes, you know what, that shirt would look good on him. I walk in there and I say, that shirt would look good on him. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this tension that I have that I need to realize I have to think beyond who I am. That's what marriage really puts me in the conflict for. And to me, the Christian faith does both, right? There's a tension there because it sharpens how much I'm focused to myself. Right? It really makes that clear. But at the same time, it's an encouragement to say that, one, my wife is the closest example I have to God on earth. Because right? she knows everything about me, and she accepts me. Right? She knows all the laundry, and she says that's cool. So, um, so to me, it's this great thing that I see this picture of this God that I love in my wife. And at the same time, I see the brokenness of who I am even more because I'm with her. That's the hardest thing. Oh, there's, a, there's a question here. Do you think that marriage, do you think Christianity is compatible with the same sex marriage? Yeah, there's a great question. Yes. So you guys are all giving me easy ones. Let's go really hard. <laughs> uh, the question was Do I think Christianity is compatible with same sex marriage? Um, so I will give you a short answer if you allow me to give you a long answer. So the short answer is I think no. Right? That's my short answer. And I'll tell you what the long answer is. First of all, I think we have to be really careful when we talk about homosexuality to somehow make that as a special thing compared to anything else. When we talk about sexuality, everyone in this room is broken. Every one of us. Somehow if you think you're more broken or less broken than somebody who's homosexual or has homosexual tendencies, I think that's a big red flag. We're all idiots, right, when it comes to the sexual notion. Either if you have the most perfect parents, that's phase one. 
I think the second thing to understand is, in Scripture, the concept of the human body is valued intensely by God. The concept of physical things, God, it matters to Him so much. You see, so many times in the Christian faith, we think, oh, you just have to believe. It's a faith thing. It's, it's spiritual. It's supernatural. It's up there. Dude, that's a Greek dualistic notion, man. When Jesus resurrected, you know what He did? He came, walked through a wall, and He said, do you have any food to eat? I'm talking about the God who's in full glory, resurrected, comes back, and he wants food. <laughs> because food matters. And when Jesus resurrected, he didn't come back as one who was, a, who was a book of perfection, words of awesomeness. He came back in flesh and blood. He said these things matter. So when it comes to our bodies, God values that intensely in what we do with them. So I think when we talk about sex in general, there's a big red flag when we say, you know what, just do whatever you want, man. It's your body. No, not at all. That is a sense of worship. That's something holy and special to God. You represent God on earth with your body. You are stewards of him on this earth. So that's the second thing we need to know. We're broken, and this is what happens. The third thing you need to know is the following thing. I don't fully get it. Right? We might have homosexual tendencies and stuff. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about actual homosexual acts. The reason, I might look at that and go, there are people who are married or homosexuals who have great lives together, far more whole lives than these broken heterosexual idiots. How the heck are you going to tell me that that's cool, but this isn't? I don't get it. Here's what I'm going to say. I know in Scripture from what I read that God isn't for a homosexual relationship. But I'll tell you this, it doesn't make sense to me fully. So I can do one of two things. I can throw it all away because that doesn't make sense. Or I can say, well, everything else is making sense to me. In most parts, it's clicking. Maybe I need to struggle with this. So the fact I'm struggling with this one thing personally, I'm going to be honest with you there, right? That's why I'm going to say that's not what God wants. But that doesn't mean I fully get it and I can tell you clear answers about it. And the last thing I'll tell you is this one thing, is that the notion of the Christian faith is about laying your life down. So if you have homosexual feelings, Great, but if you act on it, and if you think God doesn't want you to do that, I encourage you to lay that desire down. That is the notion of the Christian faith. God says, you know what, just because you have a desire doesn't mean you should act on it. Just lay it down, it's part of faith. So, I'm not sure if that makes those answers easy, but that, those are my struggles with it. And that's how I, I reconcile what the Christian faith talks about with these things. Question? Yeah. I'm not quite satisfied with the answer of why Christianity specifically. I I don't I don't see history as being a solid foundation of which I can build my faith. Like we've frequently been wrong about history, about science, about empiricism, about reason, about all these things. And yes. like we're, we're I mean we're babies in comparison to God. So like yes. how can we just be satisfied with like yes. oh Christianity is historically accurate. Like it doesn't yes. all but boil down to faith in the end like Yes, so that's a great point. You're saying, well, you can't put it all on history because there are things that have been wrong historically, scientifically, economically. So many things have been wrong, right? I agree. That's true. If you, if you just look at science, right? Just look at science. You know there's a model, there, there are models of what uh, the, the atom was supposed to be like. Do you guys remember those models you learned? And then you kind of went to college and you're like, well, we're just kidding about all that. <laughs> <laughs> so you have like new models. And now it's like string theory. Ugh, that's not, it's not even probabilities. It's whole different kinds of probabilities. We keep changing these new models in science. Even in science, I mean like big ass science, right? And yet, it's worked. Science has worked. It wasn't like the cars all of a sudden the next day stopped. Right? It still works. So I think... I don't expect to understand everything about the Christian faith before I can put my chips in the bucket. I gotta pick something, right? Just like in science, I gotta pick something. Just like in economics, I have to pick something. And to me, I'm looking around, and I wanna value something, and I say, look, there are these big notions throughout mankind's history. They have thought about God. They've always looked up to something bigger. We've, we've had a desire for something more. We wanted relationships and meaning, there these bigger things. What answers those things? Science doesn't answer those things. What are those things that are trying to answer those kind of struggles, those kind of issues? Well, religion is one example. Faith in different gods, in different religions. They're trying to answer that. And if I test all of them, the fact that I can test the Christian faith in a historical setting is more appealing to me. I'm not saying that's the only reason. That is a big reason for me to do it. 
So my encouragement to you is learn about it more and just put a couple of chips in the bucket to see if it's interesting. Right? So I'm not saying go all in, just check it out. If you've never met a scientist before, never gotten in an elevator before, I wouldn't get in there, right? I would take the stairs and make sure the guy came up. It's like, all right, you're living. <laughs> and then send your best friend up there. Like, do a couple of experiments. <laughs> so I'm not saying tomorrow you should be like, Jesus, you are the one. I'm not saying that. Just check it out. See if it makes sense. If it holds from, from what you think. So take, take the next step. That's my encouragement. Question over there? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Let's go. Is that cool? Are you in charge of it? <laughs> yeah, with the t-shirt, yeah. Science is um, uh, just one set of rules. It's uh, much better seen as a whole community of techniques. Uh, You're talking about science, right? No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, please. No, okay. We got dialectics, we got semiology, we got uh, so many uh, ways to assess uh, knowledge. summarize, you're saying the way I portrayed science is an old notion. Like, I'm talking about the way science worked several hundred years ago, and not today. But today, science is a far more richer field. But theology seems to be kind of stuck on this, these old techniques. Why am I giving science such a bad reputation by talking about it? Is that, is that somehow? Yeah. Okay. So, I, I just, first of all, I want to say that I love science. And I, I, I make money by doing science. <laughs> so, the NSF, if they're watching, what's up? <laughs> it's great, so here's, when I portray science like that, here's what I mean. All I mean is to understand that the entire notion of reality and truth through science alone is dangerous. When I talk about the enlightenment idea, I'm not saying science is bad. I'm saying if that is the only way of measuring truth and reality, that's bad. That's my only claim towards something against science. I'm a huge fan of learning about science, right? I want to work with botanists and biologists to learn about how plants fold. No matter how they're thinking about it, any notions of evolutionary theory, how those plant designs would change, I'm thirsty for it. But to say that, you know what? The only measurement of what real stuff is out there in the world is through that notion of things we can measure and test. I think that's dangerous. So that's my notion for it. Now, about the Christian faith or any other faith in general, Faith tries to address problems that science can't. So then I, it's a whole different realm to think about. Now, can you use scientific reasoning to think about faith? I don't think so. But you can use reason, you can use logic, right? you can use a whole different set of tools within theology to think about it. But the scientific method is for repeatable experiments. And that's really hard to do when it comes to historical data. You can't really repeat that experiment. Do other religions disagree with Christianity, or are they simply differing interpretations of the same thing, i.e. God? Um, the question is, do other religions disagree with Christianity, or are they just different interpretations of the same thing? I think all of, sort of all of the classic big religions with a capital R, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, all these kind of big religious notions. Of, I'm not talking about like your Uncle Walter came up with a religion. I'm talking about the big you know, religions of this world. I think all of them are trying to address the same things of what gives us meaning in life, what is truth, how do we fit into the bigger picture. There's this thirst that we all have for meaning. How is that? And they, I think, agree in a lot of things. But they don't agree in everything. 
So in other words, here's the thing. You can't pick all the religions and simply say they're all the same. Because they are actually in contradiction to one another in many ways. Remember how I said you can use reason and logic in different faiths? When you start using reason and logic, you realize that what Hinduism claims, the whole notion of it, doesn't fit in with the Christian faith. And what the Christian faith claims doesn't fit in with Islam, and doesn't fit with the Jewish faith. So in many ways there's overlap, because we're all thirsty for the same things, but at the end of the day, they're different pieces of the puzzle. They're talking about different things and different notions of seeing how the world works. All right, we have time for two more questions. Just a reminder to fill out the survey card before you leave. Okay. Um, can you give an example of a moment in your, uh, in your work in mathematics where you saw God? OK, so her question is, can I give you an example of a moment in math where I saw God? Um, so I just want to say, gosh, <laughs> let's see. So to me, um, to me, I want to, first of all, clarify one thing. So within math, when I'm doing the math that I'm going to explain to you in a, in a second, if I'm doing that, and if somebody who isn't a Christian, somebody who isn't even a theist, somebody who's an atheist or an agnostic comes, and if I'm showing this person, him or her, this beautiful math result, I'm not going to say, look, can you see God there? <laughs> because I think in doing math, you don't need to see God. Right? Math is a theory that tests, that, ex, you know, that looks for patterns and structure. And so there's intense beauty in doing that. I don't need God to have beautiful math. Right? I don't need a notion of God to make math sexy. It just is. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't mean that for me personally, I can't see how God works in math. For an atheist, for an agnostic, they might come and say, that's beautiful math. And I might say, Yes, it's beautiful math, but I see it from God's perspective. So for me, one of the greatest things that I, that, that I ever worked for, and this wouldn't make any sense if you're not a believer, but let me just explain this one thing. I was at a conference, I was a grad student, I gave a talk. Uh, first time as a grad student giving a talk, and the, one of the first things I did was put the list of references of all the people that I used for my talk, you know, kind of like a bibliography. And after I put the list of references up there on the slide, then I looked up and it turned out like 70% of the people I listed are in the room. Right, so that was nerve-wracking. So then I kept giving the stock and I came to this one picture. I put a picture up, and this guy who I was extremely nervous to ask to come to my talk, he came anyway, even if I didn't even ask, but he was the biggest name in my field. When I put this picture up, he started clapping. Right, he just, and afterwards he came to me and he said, that was beautiful. Let me know whatever I can do to write your letter of recommendation. And he said, I also have a question about that picture. And he asked me a simple question about it. He said, what's going on in that little corner? And when he asked me that question, I went back to my hotel room, and I figured out what happened in that corner, and that resulted in a whole new paper, like a whole new idea, just because of this little question about that picture. So to me, the reason I would say that was a beautiful moment when I saw God's hand in this was because of the fact that through this picture, this amazing result came. I just felt that was a beautiful thing. Now, you can look at it and go, what does God have to do with anything? And the answer is, it doesn't. I don't need God to make sense of anything that happened. But from my perspective, that's how that you got it. All right, last question. Uh, this is sort of related to your, your um, argument that you know, different religions and the capital R tend to contradict themselves. But they also developed in very different like vacuums. Like They developed to supposedly create harmonies in their societies based on how they developed historically. And they have different trajectories as well, and that's why they're suitable for certain cultures and not others. But my question is, is it, like, what makes you believe that the approach to the true God is through Christianity? Like, couldn't it be said that all these people were in pursuit of the same thing, which yes. is truth, something that doesn't change, like mountains erode, the universe will die one day. Or maybe one, and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and we're all looking for like that one immutable truth. And yes. couldn't it be said that all these attempts, if they're not necessarily wrong or right, or more wrong or more right. They yes. just happen to be the way that these people formulated it in their yes. own bubbles. Yes. So let me just phrase that question and tell me if this is right. Um, you're saying, well, different religions, these great religions, formed in certain cultures, in certain time periods, in certain settings, and formed as a reaction or maybe cause and effect based on the surroundings. So, and the Christian faith coming from the Jewish faith, you know, all these things happen for whatever reason. Why do you put your chips on that bucket 
in that particular time frame and that particular way of reality rather than these other ones. Is that, yeah. is that right? Let me just, I, wanna, I don't want to bang on this his, history, dump too, history drum too much, but let me just say one thing about this that really surprises me about the Christian faith. So, you know, throughout the Jewish culture, there was a notion of the Messiah. The Messiah is, you know, the Jewish people have always been oppressed. The Messiah is the person who's going to come from the Jewish nation who's going to set the people free. And, uh, and people were always looking for the Messiah, especially during the time of Rome. Rome was an oppressive ruler at that time. And if you think about the Jewish people, they're the most monotheistic people in the history of the universe. And the Roman race, you know, the Roman people, they were like, bring your own God, BYOG, bring your own God to the party. <laughs> and they surrounded the Jewish nation. And for them, they couldn't believe that the Lord of the universe, who they trusted, would let them be surrounded by this. So they were looking for this Messiah to set them right. And many Messiahs came. And here's what happens. The Messiah comes. He says, I will set you free. Woohoo! Everybody gets thrilled. It's like Michael Jordan for the bullet. Ooh, he's going to do it, right? Except Michael Jordan did it. Anyway, um, <laughs> the Messiah came. Everybody was thrilled. And here's what the Messiah always should do. The Messiah always should do one of three things. Uh, that person should clean the temple. Because the temple is the direct connection to God. They will clean the temple. Two, they will bring peace. And three, they will bring justice. This is what the Messiah always does. And the way the people thought is, they have to destroy Rome. Rome is the one destroying our peace and justice. So they were excited. Guys came up, and here's what always happens. Messiah rises up. Rome says, you're crucified. Messiah after Messiah after Messiah who rose up got crucified. And you know what pe the people did the next day after their Messiah got crucified? They did one of two things. They said, dang it, we picked the wrong guy. <laughs> and then they said, let's go find his brother. They always think because they think it's in the lineage, right? If you're if this guy dies, his brother must be it. They raise that guy up, boom, dead. Now, here's what I find really interesting Jesus was one of the messiahs, he got up on the messiah, boom, got crucified. The people, first of all, after he got crucified, didn't he had a brother named James? Nobody talked about James. James was like, What's up? Hey, hey, well, nothing, <laughs> never got a thank you, no invitation, nothing. So, why didn't they go to James? That's the tradition. That's interesting. The second thing is, after he got crucified and resurrected, people kept saying, he's the Messiah. And everybody's going, you're kidding me, he's the Messiah? Remember those three things that all Messiah is supposed to do? Temple is still dirty, brother. Herod is still in charge of it. He's still corrupt. Where's the peace? Where's the justice? You look outside, Caesar is still God. How the heck can you tell me this is the Messiah? And yet they said it was. Why would they do this? So there are all of these things, if you actually start looking at it, to me, that don't make any sense at all. They logically, reasonably make no sense historically of what happened. Until you actually start saying, unless there's something different about that one. I want to start looking. So that's one reason I could actually push and make sense over other things. To close, I'd like to ask Dr. David Oss if he has any final thoughts you'd like to leave with us. Um, I would love to just close by telling you a story. And this story is... Um, is about this, this German philosopher, uh, theologian, superstar named Karl Barth. And uh, Karl Barth was, is probably the most, probably the greatest theologian of the 20th century. And he has poured his entire life to studying the Christian faith. This one day he was coming out of church and a famous astronomer comes up to Karl Barth and says the following thing. He said, Professor Barth, isn't it true that all of religion, all of these, you know, isn't it true that every religion is basically saying the same thing and Karl Barth, who's poured his entire life into the theology of the Christian faith, he goes, my friend, what is this thing that all of religion is? And you, you can just summarize it? He goes, yeah. Do good unto others as they would do unto you. Isn't that the whole point of all of religion? Karl Barth thought about this for a little bit. He goes, my friend, you're an astronomer. Isn't it true that all of astronomy can also be summarized by one of these phrases? <laughs> And the guy was thinking, you're kidding me. All of astronomy, black holes, the curvature of space and time, general relativity, special relativity. He said, yeah, it's twinkle, twinkle, little star. However, <laughs> <laughs> You see, when we talk about these really complicated issues about religion, faith, my friends, you could listen to these little Twitter feeds and say, you know what, that, all of it can be summarized by this. Isn't all of the Christian faith just this? 
isn't all of religion just this? It's not just that. There are intense, complicated things to study about when you talk about physics, when you talk about astronomy, when you talk about linguistics, when you talk about English, literature, and science. And same thing for any faith. Look deeply into it and don't be afraid to get messy. Thanks, guys. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.